Hello. All right. Welcome to today's webinar presented by DataArt and Microsoft. My name is Scott Rayburn, and I'll be your host for this exciting journey into the world of building generative AI solutions on Microsoft Azure. Before introducing our fantastic speakers, Dimitri and Amanda, let me take a moment to introduce our topic. So you may know that today is the one year anniversary of ChatGPT, which makes it the perfect day for a webinar about the power of generative AI and the ecosystem of technologies like Microsoft Azure and service providers like DataArt that are enabling its implementation. A couple statistics on the economic opportunity here. IDC projects that generative AI will add nearly $10 trillion to global GDP over the next 10 years. And according to a study sponsored by Microsoft released earlier this month, companies are already realizing a 3.5x return on investment for every $1 they spend. However, according to an EY survey, 68% of business leaders in the UK are facing challenges in adopting generative AI due to uncertainty around the technology. Indeed, for many businesses, it's challenging to figure out where to start on their transformative journey and how to use generative AI to effectively drive growth, enhance productivity, productivity, and stay ahead of the competition. Today, we are here to bridge that gap. Um, DataArt and Microsoft have partnered together for more than 20 years, developing innovative technology solutions for leading companies. And now we've joined forces to present you with insights, strategies, and practical approaches to harness the power of generative AI on Azure. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers, Amanda Wong, AIML Cloud Solutions Architect at Microsoft, and Dmitry Baikov, Technical Director of AIML from DataArt. So let's not waste any more time and dive into this exciting topic. Amanda, the floor is yours to tell us about all things Azure AI. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that. Um, so first, I'm going to set the scene up a little bit. You mentioned that ChatGPT entered the headlines a year ago from today. And since then, we've seen quite a storm in generative AI headlines and news reports. Um, it's kind of unavoidable right now. And we're seeing that it's not only just about hype, but we're also seeing real world applications with customers out there applying to end users. So I have a couple examples here on this screen. Um, I'm talking about CarMax, which used content generation with GPT models to drastically reduce the amount of time it took to generate summaries and descriptions for used cars for their customers in a matter of days. And the second example I wanted to highlight is with Progressive Insurance, which is helping to save $10 million annually with AI-powered chatbots to help users answer questions about their insurance coverage um, and any customer scenarios. But before I get into the weeds of how some of this has happened and then hand it over to Dimitri to talk about practical implementation, I do want to give some background about Microsoft Cloud and some of the core pillars about our mission and what goes into how we develop our services. So our mission is to empower every person and organization on the planet. And with the era of AI, this mission is more important than ever. And so we are committed to working with partners like DataArt to deliver this to customers and to more people. So speaking of our partnership, one of our core partnerships um, of relevance, particular relevance to this talk is with OpenAI. Um, and so we've been working with them to advance AI research, to develop uh, AI computing platforms, um, as well as to make this technology more accessible to all types of developers, whether they are new to coding or more sophisticated data scientists. And I'll be talking about some of the tools and services that we've built to have native integration with existing services, as well as third-party frameworks to deliver um, new applications. So there are not only our OpenAI partnership, but we also have several other partnerships across different technology sectors to enable customer choice and to make sure that we are staying at the edge of some of the most innovative technology. So some of that includes the popular hugging face frameworks to deliver open source models and data sets on our Azure platform, 
or development. We are also working with Meta, for example, to offer the Llama 2 model for fine tuning. And most recently announced at our Ignite conference a few weeks ago um, to offer Llama 2 as a pay as you go inference service. So we understand that customers may want to enable choice for multiple generative AI models aside from GPT. So Meta Llama 2 is one example of those. We also partner with NVIDIA to offer specialized AI compute platforms uh, to train models and do inferencing. But we know we can't do all of this alone, which is why we partner with folks like DataArt, which is a Microsoft partner as well as Azure consulting partner um, for data protection and data management services. So Dimitri is going to talk about more of our collaboration and some real world scenarios and use cases. Um, but I do want to talk a bit more about some of the technology that is most applicable here. And so where we are in the landscape is in the bottom right corner where you see the highlighted purple Azure OpenAI service. This sits in our customizable AI models. And you'll notice that in this stack that a lot of this technology is embedded into existing tools and services across Azure, across our application platform for business users and analytics folks, as well as our scenario-based services for specific end-to-end -end scenarios such as bots or extracting information from documents such as PDFs or Word documents or analyzing chapters and transcripts from videos through Video Indexer and analyzing content and helping to determine decisions or detect anomalies through services like Metrics Advisor, as well as our decision tree uh, cognitive services. And at the base layer of this stack is again the machine learning platform, which is one of the focuses of today's talk. How can we take this technology and make it customizable on your company data or for your specific use case? So how have folks already taken some of this technology and implemented it? I gave two very brief examples earlier, but I also wanted to make this feel a little bit more real with a use case from H&R Block. So H&R Block used technology such as document intelligence to extract tables, to extract paragraphs, and other types of key information from massive amounts of forms to, for classification using um, cognitive search to enable customer queries in a more contextualized uh, understanding to deliver more relevant and effective results. And so you can see here um, the amount of tax documents they were able to classify was 30 million um, per year, which is a drastic difference from what they were able to do manually. And we've published this full story on the Microsoft blog. So highly encourage if you're interested in understanding how this was happening with cognitive search and open AI models, um, we encourage you to check that out. But please stick around for some of the uh, scenarios that we'll be talking about with data art as well. So that's some examples about um, what has already been built, but the focus is what will you build? What will you contribute to the ever-evolving generative AI landscape? So some of the focuses that I want to highlight are one, contextual interactions. How can you support your customers in ways that you can both acquire and retain talent as well as engagement? A lot of customer expectations are changing to expect more personalized recommendations, more effective results when interacting with customer service or chatbots, or even a more simple uh, website for your company. As well as amplified automation, what kinds of tasks can be streamlined and delivered at scale to make jobs easier and customers more excited about engaging with your product? And finally, I wanted to highlight intuitive discovery. In what ways can we utilize search capabilities to have your customers figure out what they're going to discover next and how they can use information to help develop their own goals or technologies and services as well. 
So I gave some background about the Azure AI platform and what some companies have been doing with this technology, but I'm going to talk a bit more about what the concrete technology looks like and what you can do. So at a high level, with the Azure OpenAI service, you see that we have several models here, and these are constantly changing. Even earlier this month with Azure, with OpenAI Dev Day announcing some more recent models, those models have since been included in Azure OpenAI um, and are now available for uh, testing and use. So as um, we're going to talk about the GPT models more in depth in a bit, this is a high level view of some of those chat models that are underlying some of the um, more popular interactions you may have had with a chat GPT interface. These are the same models um, within an Azure context and can be utilized for very similar applications in a chat scenario or um, completion text completion scenario. And on the right, not only do we have text completion, but we have generative AI um, image generation, as well as understanding audio transcripts and recordings um, for translation with the Whisper model. I also wanted to highlight that with all of these models, um, prompt flow on Azure has also been recently made generally available to help scale workflows and prompt engineering to iterate on the development of these models, to connect them to your broader application development services, and as well as third-party plugins with functions as well. So I do want to take a moment to recognize GPT-4 and speak to how this is a shift from some of the previous GPT models we may have seen on Azure. So with GPT-4, this is really the next level in text generation. And there are several reasons for this. The first is that it is trained to generate more complex document documents as well as intake a lot longer inputs. So with prompt engineering, it can intake more nuanced instructions to deliver results that feel more specific, feel more relevant and personalized, um, as well as translating it into multiple languages and understanding contextualized everyday language uh, from customers. But GPT models are made even more powerful when they are paired with services to extract information from existing types of documents. So take, for example, an unstructured document, a PDF, or it, even a presentation. How can we pair some of the amazing capabilities of these Azure OpenAI models and utilize search capabilities to traverse all of that information and turn it into knowledge and generate, for example, summaries to answer questions. All of this can be done with the broader landscape of connecting these different technologies here. But how can we make this feel a bit more real for industries, for example? So let's speak to financial industries and what we're seeing with banking and um, some inspiration for where you might be able to take some of this technology. So for example, there's client engagement. How can we help enable advisors to offer recommendations that feel right to their customer regarding timing and context? There are also opportunities to understand markets better and to enable predictions that inform present actions, as well as supplementing investor report summarization and making this more accessible to all types of customers through translation and um, other forms of visual accessibility as well. In the retail space, what we're seeing is that companies are taking GPT models and using them for product innovation, such as analyzing market trends similarly to what we saw in banking, um, but with customer um, and retail trends. There are also opportunities to identify anomalies in manufacturing at the front line, such as production errors or defects using computer vision models um, and analysis. There are also ways to generate more evergreen content so that you are delivering fresh, relevant content throughout the year, um, regardless of season, and flexible to different product offerings. 
And at the front line with field sellers, you can help them customer, customize uh, scenarios when working with potential leads and converting them into sales. And finally, the last industry that I want to highlight before passing it over to Dimitri are insurance use cases. I did speak to h and Block, I spoke to Progressive, and similarly here at a high level, um, what we can automate is our claims processing with document intelligence, the PDF extractor and document extractor I mentioned earlier, as well as search capabilities. You can also leverage GPT models for fraud detection, similar to anomaly detection, to make sure that you are processing insurance documents and not losing money at scale. You can also increase customer satisfaction and improve the experience of interacting with insurance documents with your insurance provider by answering customer queries with accuracy. But that's not all. I want to turn it back on to your scenario and your data. Here's a high-level diagram of how this works with taking data sources, regardless of where they sit, in SQL, in Cosmos DB, um, or additional third-party data sources, we want to enable you to bring your data wherever it sits, wherever you feel comfortable with keeping it secure, and pairing it with Azure OpenAI service on your data to customize it even further than what it's like out of the box for your application. So where can you do this? We have made the Azure AI Studio generally available um, for everyone to build and train your own models to perform the customization that I just spoke to with some of the models in our model catalog, whether that's GPT models or Llama 2 or models from Hugging Face, for example. And you can pair this with built-in vector indexing, other native tools to um, optimize your workflow for data science, whether it's low code or no code. And I can't speak about this without acknowledging that there's going to be so much content in this generative AI era. Whether it's inputs or outputs, um, with AI, we want to make sure that we are creating content and contributing content to the world that is um, responsible and can have moderation tools to effectively traverse all of the content that's being built. And so with the Azure Content Safety Tool, which is made generally available now, um, it, mod it moderates across four different categories of harm with different thresholds. So this can help customize for your use case to make sure that uh, you don't have uh, misintended applications of technology. And we're doing this because at the core of all of our AI development are our responsible AI principles. And we want to make sure that Microsoft Cloud is a partner that you can trust with your data because your data is not used to train open AI foundation models without your permission. It is not going to be used for our own internal services as well. Your data is protected in your tenant with some of the most comprehensive enterprise compliance and security controls. And we want to make sure that responsible AI is implemented um, at every step of model development and deployment to your end users. So that's all I have for now. I'm going to pass it back to Scott, um, and that is at a high level Azure OpenAI. Amazing. Thank you, Amanda, for that robust tour through all things Azure AI, um, you know, the newest developments as well as kind of the use cases and the general overview as well. Um, while we transition over to Dimitri, I wanted to ask you personally about your experience working with DataArt as a partner um, to implement some of the things you just talked about. Yeah, so I've worked with DataArt to um, develop offerings for generative AI, for broader LLMs, for document intelligence as well, um, for various industries. And I'm excited to speak with Dimitri a bit more about how can we scale uh, proofs of concepts, for example, for customers to get a better feel for how this technology can work on their specific data. Awesome. Yeah, um, data art is all about making this stuff real for our customers. Um, and speaking of proofs of concept, I think Dimitri has some of those to tell us about, um, a demo, all sorts of good stuff. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Dimitri. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Amanda, and hello, everyone. I think it's very important to highlight before we dive to the solutions that uh, the things like privacy and uh, bringing your data and responsible AI are three top pillars of what we see our clients ask for. And that's uh, what we do when we start developing the AI Gen AI project. We always think about the data, where it's stored, is it private or not private? What are the data control laws and how these models will be used? Are they secure and private? So all of these uh, projects I will speak about, they are working in this domain. So it's, it's quite safe to develop uh, the, the solutions there. And there are so many applications, which Amanda also mentioned. So I will be speaking from the terms of all, like our clients and the feedback we got from the market. Uh, we operate in the uh, huge amount of industries. That's why I will speak more general in horizontal uh, direction. And uh, I think that main key areas where we find our clients request that uh, chatbots, document processing or document intelligence, uh, different types of smart search, coding assistance, and of course, different other ways, which may be similar to this or maybe uh, as a different category. So a couple of examples uh, about the chatbots. So chatbots, it's a, a huge uh, tool. They are already with us for, for years, but for now, the whole Gen AI approach reimagined that. And uh, we started to think differently how these chatbots may reply and what they can do. And starting from support, uh, from help desk teams for classification of the tickets, understanding what uh, this ticket should do, redirection of the ticket, triaging, and all the way through knowledge base and how to build the chatbots with the easy access to your knowledge base. And what if we have the call center? And what if we want to bring this uh, data closer to our support agents, right? So all of these, all these use cases are powered by Gen AI and they really give the, the speed and they give the performance boost, the accuracy in replies and the, they upskill your uh, employees and they upskill you as well in case you don't know the hidden gems inside your company or your organization, right? You can find them out in case they are there in the chatbot. So this is, uh, this is really straightforward use case, I would say, but it really gives the value and you can tune these chatbots. You can work with a different person is internal type, external type. So this is the whole range of systems you can build there. And, and of course, document processing is the crucial part for, for the chatbots, but not only. So it, the documents is the, the um, blood of some organizations. So they work with these documents really whole time and uh, how to get the data out of these documents was the big question years ago and there were some advancements in NLP which uh, get us to document classification to some data extraction but right now with uh, open AI models with generative AI uh, we can do it much faster we can extend it to different types of formats. So the same model can be used for emails, for documents, for the same dialogues in chats. We can classify them, we can generate the emails, we can uh, extract the, the complex data structures which we needed to train the previously models on, we need to label this data, but for now it's, it's fairly easy to start and fairly easy to integrate and see the real impact. And speaking about the email, even physical mail, how we can digitalize physical mail and what we can do with generative AI with that. Imagine you scan your mail and then you digitalize it, you get the text and you generate the reply automatically and print it and you can send it right away. So it influences the, the physical world as well it was with less human efforts. So that's what we observed in uh, banks and insurance organizations ac across the globe. So the search is is also the core part. If if you have the good search algorithms, if you have, then you have a good recommendation engine, and you can match people uh, better to each other. You can match the the content to the people. You can match the people between each other, and you can explain this match as well. So these are all the use cases we observed as well in in different industries, starting from healthcare, how to match the patients and and doctors better, how to explain. Uh, the the query to, from patient to doctor and vice versa and uh, how to like search across uh, different space big space of the documents as well so basically you can think about imagine you have the chatbots on your laptop where you can access everything which you have there any presentation any document so this is what can be done 
on the organization level, on the product level as well, with the organizational data and your pro profile data as well. So this is also a big uh, direction where we find the uh, interest uh, of our clients and uh, embeddings models also opens huge opportunities how to work with text data in, in the search uh, terms as well. And one maybe unusual way of working with Gen AI models is the coding assistance tasks. So starting from GitHub Copilot, which helps a lot uh, to be boost a lot of things here, we can think about like tiny improvements as well. So think about security scanning, small uh, niche security scanning tools, for instance, for the languages which are not supported by GitHub Copilot or explainability of the code of very specific codes again, documentation generation, uh, even legacy code migration in a way that it generates the, the file or uh, a number of files, it split the files, it optimized the file. So all of that starting to roll out in, in different tools uh, as well. But but even for now, you can do in uh, like chat GPT mode, all of that. And again, with the Azure deployed OpenAI models, it can be securely integrated to your CI CD pipelines, to different uh, repositories, and with your specific needs in case this need is not addressed by, by the tools on the market. So this is pretty, uh, yeah, in depth explanation. So and the question may arise, how, how to build these chatbots and documents and how to do the smart search. So what we suggest and how we do that. So we have the four stages, basically. As soon as you know your use case, imagine you want to build some document processing solution. You, you define this use case. And then we go to the prototyping mode. AI has uncertainty sometimes, and we need to prove that it works, test it on a lot of data, test how, how responsive it is, and, and then uh, we want to scale that. So in six to eight weeks, we do this prototyping part. We evaluate different models. We try different Gen AI approaches. We do prompt engineering, and then we build a clickable prototype, which we show to the business and show to the um, uh, clients and ask for the feedback. And in some feedback iterations, we go to the MVP development. So we now understand that this chatbot or document processing part is working. How we bring it to millions of requests per day, how we, how we bring it to different clients, different organizations, different hospitals, patients, etc. So all of that starting to be engineering part of the AI solution. And uh, we call it MVP when we move something to production and we uh, develop it as a scalable, we test different data sets, we improve. And again, the research continues, but for now, uh, we're focusing on this part, how to bring it closer to the customer, do A-B testing, assess the results, and then roll out to the whole system eventually. And that's when we go live, actually, and we collect the feedback now from the real users. We understand their needs, and we tune the model and tune the approach later on the support phases. So this is our Gen AI flow and journey. And this is only for the for the first use case, right? And what if you have number of use cases and you want to power your organization with AI and you just started, you have the first great results and how to build how to build it on scale. Of course you need to scale your data science team, but from the engineering perspective, we think about that as a platform. So you need to have one single place, one data lake enabling data engineering scalable approach to building AI projects. And again, it's not only about Gen AI, it's about the AI overall. So how to have an access to the data, how to build these cases on the scale and how to move from one use case in production to 10 use cases in production. So that's what we call AI platform. And the next level after that is what we call AI factory. So imagine you develop one document processing solution already, and you have a number of departments. So you can re reuse this accelerator. You can reuse that approach to the different type of data and tune it inside your organization, basically without integration, without implementing of the new code. So you build your new AML use cases in a way that they are scalable to different data as well. So that's what we call AI factory, which gives you to scale from tens 10 use cases, five use cases to tens of use cases across different departments right away. So with that, I want to show our AI solution and how we move to production basically in this one to three months time frame. And this is data art chatbot. So uh, if you go to our website, data.com, and this is in public, you can do it right now. And uh, I'm sure that OpenAI, uh, Azure OpenAI will uh, 
be uh, ready for that. So this is live. You can, you can, you know, I can uh, update the page, and uh, this is working. So you can see. The, in the bottom right corner, the chatbot button. And uh, this is our AI chatbot, which basically we developed and it's trained on data data. So it knows about the data, it has the relevant information up to this summer and it knows everything what happens. It knows our website. And I prepare a couple of the questions actually for, for this chatbot so we can understand that, uh, how it works. So I want to ask, what can you tell about Microsoft and data partnership? So let's see what, what it can come up with. And you can try your own questions. We have a lot of interesting things included here, like guardrails, responsible AI. Uh, it's, it can uh, reflect to, to your uh, tricky questions as well. Uh, but first idea is to show what, what is data. And you can see basically what Scott mentioned in the beginning that we have 20 year history of collaboration. We are different types of partners and DevOps across the globe, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this like overview of basically some pages of our website available right there. So this is the best knowledge base you, you can have. So let's try something else. So let's try uh, the other question, right? Do you know how data does generative AI projects? So let's try. Let's try something more related to, to our topic today. And this is on our website, right? So we have uh, AI ML services. You can go there, you can check the content, but, but why do you need that if you have this chatbot, which will think a bit and then do the summary for you based on the same uh, documents, which you will try to find and uh, try to look for. Uh, so it, it thinks a bit and uh, then it returns like pretty big understanding. And it, as you can see, uh, we approach Gen AI with these type of things. So we have a YAML solution, a YAML platform, and a YAML factory. So basically, that's what we described. And uh, we have discovery workshops. We can prototype in six weeks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is this is right there, and this is available. So I will ask something more tricky, uh, like, do you know something about Gen AI webinar and Azure in November? So let's try something like that. And this is again to show that it's, it's not ideal, of course. It will not respond to everything. It will be, you know, it still needs to be up to date. It still needs to understand what are you doing. You can ask, try to re-ask the questions and it may think a bit different topics. So it's still sometimes random, but overall, as you see, it still gives you some response. And, and in this case, it doesn't have any specific information, but you can contact us and you can ask for any information you need and both about Azure and both about AI. So this is how it's designed. It gives you the real link, the real email addresses in case you don't know the information. It doesn't harm anyone. So it's based on responsive AI techniques and I encourage everyone to try it on your own. So this is a small demo from my side. And I think it's back to Scott, so we are ready for the questions. Great. Yeah, as a representative of the data art uh, marketing team, I must say I love the chatbot. Um, it's trained with all of the materials we work so hard on creating, and it actually puts them to use in a new and innovative way. So please do check that out. Um, as we get organized for the Q&A, actually, Dimitri, let me ask you about this QR code here. Um, something about a six-week prototype? What's that all about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what uh, Amanda was mentioning as well. So we actually prepared this uh, Azure AI uh, marketplace offering uh, for you. You can reach out to us through the website. It's deployed on Azure Marketplace. And in case you're interested in something I already showed or any use case we described, we offer this six-week Gen AI solution. So you can apply through the form and we'll reach out to you and speak about your use case, your organization, and how to build it for you. So this is it. Uh, this is like our small uh, uh, Eastern egg here. Uh, and I encourage everyone who, who is interested to try it out. So back to you. Perfect. Thank you, Dimitri. All right, let's get started with the Q&A here. Um, Amanda, I have a question for you actually as the moderator. Um, so I know you have a front row seat to all this generative AI craziness. And I was just curious how you personally kind of separate the hype from reality. How do you think about all this stuff that's happened in the last year? 
Yeah, there, that's a great question, especially since there have been so many important developments um, within the past year. So I do my best to stay up to date with reading about industry trends, um, but also I do have a front row seat to some of the internal developments with OpenAI and some of our generative AI technology. But what helps make it feel a bit more real um, and less like hype is when folks like Data Art bring customer scenarios to us and we get to talk about them. We get to think through what are some trade offs of different technologies? What is the best path to delivering a solution based on a problem? And being able to talk to customers, think through problems like that, and test different technologies to see how they work um, to and comparing results is really exciting. That's what makes it feel a lot more real for me. Nice. So yeah, you have the full toolbox at your disposal. Just got to pick the right tools, the right partners, the right use cases. Sounds really interesting. Um, another question here, I think maybe, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe both of you might have a thought on this. How would fraud detection work for an insurer? I guess that means fraud detection with generative AI. Um, so Amanda, do you want to start? Yeah, I can speak to that at a high level. And Dimitri, I'm not sure if you want to speak to some of more uh, concrete examples that you've worked with, with proofs of concept. But with the on the technology side, with fraud insurance, uh, fraud detection, for example, um, you can extract information from large amounts of forms from, for example, a user's history, or you can aggregate findings of forms or cases that have been labeled as fraud, for example. Um, and that can help train the model to identify a through a classification system. Is this similar to previous training examples or not? And if there is an anomaly in a user's history, or if it flags it as a very similar to labeled cases of fraud, then that's how it's able to surface at scale um, what may be different and worthy of further human review. Yeah, I, I can also add to this one. So basically what we observe that a lot of companies already have for detection systems working and you are building these systems in basically AI uh, for years already. And we see that Gen AI can help in explainability parts of this system. So you can explain why it thinks it's fraud and it can explain in human readable manner. Also, it can analyze the big amounts of uh, decisions made by some classical model and again explain the bunch of decisions. So it can do the summary about these decisions, about one specific organization or analyze the whole transactions about one specific client for the last three months and do some statistics and do some explainability. So that's that's what, where we see the power of Gen AI and that's where we see it conjuncts with the classical uh, AI approaches, So, which is also an interesting uh, part of it. That explainability sounds great to me. Um, I tried to cash a check and my bank froze my account for a whole week and no one could explain it, but they just said, nope, you're done for a week. Um, so that was that was interesting to me. Um, yeah. Now for my next question, um, actually this is more of a comment, but I think it's a really interesting one. Um, so if AI becomes the norm to generate emails, chat responses and other documentation, what if we all start to sound exactly the same? Is it going to drastically change the way we speak as a society? Yeah, I, I love these kind of questions. I, I can try to answer this one. So uh, it depends how much in future you want to go. So we can go one month, one year, and 10 years, and it all will vary. I think that in 10 years, you can train AI way to speak in your terms, right? You take your Facebook, you take your uh, messengers and it will speak as is you, right? In more closer perspective, uh, you, can, uh, you can tune the prompts and tune the temperature uh, depending on how you want it to react to your responses. So I don't think it will sound the same in future. Different models will build differently and uh, you will tune your response as if you want. And in the longest future, you can, yeah, I can speak instead of you as well. And and with voice, exactly, and with text, exactly as well. So there are already some uh, models which can be tuned to your voice and can speak your regards as well. 
So this is maybe not in years, maybe it's odd, but maybe three years right from now. I would add to Dimitri's point that I think we are seeing a shift in different attitudes towards AI with the rise of different types of co-pilots or assistance to helping you uh, do work that can help save time overall. Um, so often AI, generative AI in particular, can be used to not necessarily replace people or jobs, but to augment daily tasks. And so it's not it really depends on how they are used by um, end users, not necessarily to replace the way that people speak, for example, but to start as, to provide a starting point for how to draft up an email, for example, or create a proposal. And from there, it is enabled to work with the human review or the end user to figure out what feels right and is appropriate for the use case. Um, and so to Dimitri's point, you can help streamline that, that connection and that collaboration between AI and human through your own data. Um, but that is the dynamic and we're seeing a shift in that direction as well. Great, thank you both for your answers to that question. Um, moving on. Someone asks, what type of knowledge-based document can be used for chatbots? Um, does it have to be SharePoint, PDF documents? I guess at this point, you can use many, many, many different types of, types of documents. Maybe another side of the question is, where are the limitations? What can't be used as a knowledge base? I think there are specifics uh, from us, my standpoint. For instance, you want index more uh, like programmatic data types like JSON or XML or the code, there may be some issues and differences in how you index the PDFs and doc files. The same with tables, the same with images right now. But I think in future, it will all be uh, the one algorithm for indexing everything. And basically you will not uh, think about that at all. But for now, uh, there are differences depending on data structure and data type. But if you speak about the data, I think it can be anything which represents the data, even the picture uh, of the your check of your invoice converted to the text or uh, your call, which converted to the text as well. So basically any type of input which can be converted to the text, the video as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are some nuances depending on complex data structures. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Amanda. Could you tell us a little bit more about customer intent identification service in Azure AI? Yeah, so customer intent identification can be approached in a few ways. So I, I briefly mentioned some cognitive services. There is a family of services under uh, the decision umbrella. And this helps in scenarios, for example, like recommending certain products based on user behavior on a shopping website, for example. And that can help surface actions or next steps for a user to take uh, that is personalized to them. Um, but there are also opportunities to understand user intent through natural language processing and through some of our text analytics services um, in cognitive services. Now, I mentioned earlier that a lot of this technology is very similar or uses the same types of models and research. Um, and so you may see different types of performance and that's where we do a lot of testing and proofs of concepts. And uh, data art is an example of that, of helping configure and set up the different um, examples and scenarios and performance uh, with different services. So those are some examples to take a customer query and understand using large amounts of training data and augmenting it with other types of input signals to determine what is the customer intent and to not only understand it, but to present action items and next steps. Thank you, Amanda. Um, a next, our next question is about the visual side of generative AI um, and some of the lawsuits against artists for stealing styles and imagery. So if these artists actually win the lawsuits, what do you think that will mean for the future of generative imagery? I think I need to be an artist to answer that. But, uh, you know, I believe that uh, there are 
big shifts in how we understand the legal parts of the content right now as well, from both codes, uh, text, and images as well. Uh, sometimes the people, the, the companies who are training the models exclude something, uh, some artists from their uh, generation exclude some real people from their, their generation. So I think that this is fairly new field and there are some uh, edge corner cases which should be uh, um, we should be governed and should discussed. So I think that we'll still be able to generate uh, the images and generate videos. There will be different types of models. Uh, maybe some models will have an agreement. Some companies will have an agreement with a specific artist and by paying him some loyalty fee, they will be able to generate his works as well. The same as uh, basically different companies can use the uh, faces of the actors to play the generated movies and swap their faces as well. So I, I think there will be the, new, the, the exact, uh, exciting times for the new agreements between the creativity and these uh, big companies. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I can, I can tell more about that. Yeah, that's a big can of worms to open up on our uh, AI webinar here. Um, Let's go to a more technical question. So is it mandatory to use Cosmos DB to confine AI models as, um, or the data boundaries of AI models? Or can blob storage perform the job of Cosmos DB? What's the difference between data and Cosmos DB and blob for an AI model? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so it really does not matter at the end of the day to the GPT model, but the decision is really up to you and what your data looks like and how you are harvesting and transforming your data in existing workflows or even new workflows. So a difference between Cosmos DB versus blob storage is how often does your data change, for example? Um, how long do you need to archive your data for? Um, what, how quickly do you need the response and inference uh, and to update the training data that your chat model, for example, um, may understand. So those are some of the differences to help clear the air to distinguish what the difference is between when should you use Cosmos DB versus Blob. Um, happy to discuss those more, even data art to have that conversation for your specific data management scenario. Um, but for the GPT model or AI model or fine tuning, it really doesn't matter um, because it can take in different sources of data, whether or not it sits in Azure or in another cloud or on premises, for example. Um, there are different connectors to bring your data to models. Great, yeah, there's, there's many methods to get there, I guess, right? Um, Next question is about training. How long does it take to train? What is the validity and reliability of the response? Um, maybe in the context of the chatbot you demoed, Dimitri, what was training like for that? Yeah, so the training was basically what Amanda just described. So it's about bringing your data storage and connecting it to GPT models and it can be any data storage. So we, we were not training the model for that. We were using uh, the thing what's called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, to build the chatbot uh, together with your uh, documents. And uh, we validated with a uh, number of uh, different metrics. Uh, there are some automatic um, digital uh, digit story metrics, how to check how good is your model for specific uh, responses. And uh, we detect, we checked by different tricky questions as well. Uh, it's It was manual check by, by the people. So we try to validate with the end users, let's call them like that, and uh, see how they react to that. And uh, the, the lengths, uh, of uh, the context uh, is limited as well, which uh, may be uh, around, I think that's 100K in the latest GPT-4 version and uh, around a 16K in GPT-3.5 Turbo. Uh, so it, it, K, I mean tokens. So it's basically like 14,000 words and uh, 80,000 words approximately. Uh, so it's quite a long context. and. Uh, that, that's what we are building. So we are staying in the same context. We are adding more data dynamically based on our data sources, and we validate it with the human efforts uh, before 
the release uh, by coroner cases. So for now, there is no like fully autonomous way how to test that because it, the text might be different. And we also keep it uh, a bit different as well because we are also testing in production. That's why we uh, do not limit it to one single response each time. We want to and uh, behave a bit differently so we can check how it reacts to the same queries and we we can uh, review these uh, logs and review uh, the basically the responses so that's how we will evolve uh, later based on the real world feedback and questions great all right well dimitri it looks like you also answered one of our other questions about how you're testing validating it in an automated yeah. way so perfect that was two for one guys um yeah. nice job um well i think that's all the time we have today um i want to thank everyone especially our speakers dimitri baikov and amanda wong for their time today and sharing all of their insights with you if your question did not answered or did not get answered from the chat or you have another question you are welcome to reach out to the email on the screen um and with that, I wish you all well. Have a great day and weekend once we get there on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye.